Well, I think the new age, and you know, we can call it the hippies back in the 60s, actually had it right all along. But now we're able to scientifically show that, yes, we do have a vibration. Uh, my guest today is Roland McCrayton from the HeartMath Institute in California. Uh, if you're interested in breathing techniques, particularly uh, coherent breathing or resonant breathing, you may have come across some of HeartMath's products because they make like a heart rate variability sensor that goes on your ear and gives you biofeedback about the kind of coherence levels within your body. Um, and that's kind of where I first heard about HeartMath. And I assumed that they were like a tech startup um, coming out with a product like that. Uh, but the, I dug a little deeper and it turns out, no, they're actually a very established uh, research institute in the US and they've been researching this stuff from before the beginning of coherence being a word that kind of people used uh, since I think 1990 um, is when they set up. Um, and before we get into exactly what coherence is, I'm just gonna read you some of the benefits. So if any of these sound appealing to you, if any of these could be useful, then please do watch the rest of the interview and then go away and research heart math and Roland. Uh, and they're not paying me to say this, I'm just very interested in their research. Um, so reduce perception of stress, sustained positive affect, high degree of mental clarity, increased emotional stability, improved sensory motor integration, cognitive and task performance, reduction in internal mental dialogue, increased feelings of inner peace, more effective decision-making, enhanced creativity, increased intuitive discernment, I really like that one, uh, reduced blood pressure, uh, improved hormonal balance, lower lipid levels, um, I've got another page, but I don't want to bore you too much, but there is another page of benefits there. And this is from stuff that they've researched over 10 years ago now. So the research has only got deeper and more interesting uh, since then. Um, so Roland, thank you so much for joining me. I've had uh, a lot of fun uh, researching your, your research over the last week. Uh, it's really fascinating stuff. Um, so I guess where we could start is maybe if you tell me a little bit about um, what coherence is on, on an individual level, what does that actually mean for people who maybe haven't heard of it before? Yeah, okay, that's probably a great place to start. Uh, I think most people have sort of an intuitive sense of the word coherence and what it means. Uh, I mean, if you look it up in most dictionaries, the, the first definition is the quality of somebody's speech, right? So hopefully I'm able to put my words together in a way that today in our in our chat that uh, cre gives a uh, coherent meaning right and if I had a little bit too much to drink last night maybe I'm coming in and you know and I'm kind of uttering nonsense you know I'm incoherent right um, but it's also used in physics in, in a similar way actually when you dig a little bit deeper but coherence in, in the physics side and the science side is always talking about a, a usually a complex system it has a lot of parts and how all those parts are, how well or not those parts are working together. Mm. So in a coherent system, uh, and this applies to whether it's atoms, cells, bodies, cosmos, you know, um, social units, uh, how well are those individual parts working together so that in a coherent system, it always implies and means that the individual parts have to be somehow connected and communicating with each other, that there's a harmonious order that where the, th the system is working together in a way that is energy efficient and gives rise to something greater than the individual parts mm. in a coherent so, so what does that mean to me as an as a in my individual yeah, yeah. self so I, I kind of wanted to give that broad context first because we use the term to not only describe uh the activity and the within our own bodies, brains, nervous systems, immune systems, hormonal systems, how well are all those systems working together? So if, if we're personally coherent, that, well, in fact, I just kind of said it, that really means all of our inner body systems across all time, scale and, and time, uh, we're in a coherent state. Our, we're working at our, at our uh, optimum, optimal function. Everything's working in harmony and aligned and, and energy efficient, mm. right? And as it turns out, that's best reflected in the rhythms of the heart. Now we, we have to go a bit deeper into that for people to understand that. Uh, but then we can also use the terms we might get to, I don't know how much time we have, mm. in terms of our social units and families and, and communities and also even globally. Um, and we have a fairly incoherent world right now, I would say, in many ways, but 
also a lot of coherent pockets popping up right in the middle of the incoherence. So kind of getting ahead of myself a little bit. No, no, it's fine. I hope that helps. You, uh, yeah. So, cause you, cause you, I think you kind of touch on it there, but in, in one of your books, you say, um, the heart is the most powerful generator of rhythmic information patterns in the body. And so is that what you mean when you say it's, it's like, if, if we can be in coherence with that rhythm in the other rhythms of our body? Well, sort of. Um, so the heart rhythm, I mean, the heart, uh, as we dig deeper into it, becomes a key player in many ways in, in the body's functions, way past what most people have thought about or considered or, or understood. So if we just kind of talk at a, at a basic level, the, the heart and brain are interconnected through nerve, nerves, the nervous system, the autonomic nervous system, more deeply and fundamentally than any other systems in our body. So in fact, you know, we, we tend, people tend to think about the, it used to be that in, even in, in the physiology sciences and psychophysiology that, I mean, this is kind of silly now that even can, to think that we used to think this, you know, back in the 30s and in the 40s that the brain was basically the master of everything. And theoretically, if you could cut the head off and give it, you know, the right blood flow and oxygen, that it'd be just fine, right? But the body was just there to carry the head around. Uh, that's that's absurd now. Nobody believes that anymore. But that used to be a dominant paradigm. Uh, and in fact, what shifted that paradigm going back, well, I won't go into all the history here, was was observations of the activity of the heart, right? Because the, 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 supposedly the body just did what the brain said, right? And then st we started observing, this is before my time, that the heart in particular didn't do that. It had its own its own logic and, and it acted like it had its own brain and acted independently. So in terms were introduced back then to describe the activity, not only that, um, then they, well, I should back up a little bit here. Then they started seeing that not only did the heart have its, not, not only obey what the brain was saying, but it would actually perceive the brain in, in its changes and inform the brain. And this led to a very famous hypothesis in psychophysiology, that community, is that the, the heart has a causal role in modulating perception mm. and creating emotional experience. And, um, and terms were introduced back then to describe the effects that the, the activity of the heart had on brain function. And one of those was called cortical inhibition. Cortex, part of our brain we get paid to go to work for, right? You know, the thinking brain could either be inhibited or facilitated depending upon what the heart was doing. Now, we didn't understand all the mechanisms back then. We, we clearly do now, but, but those were the, the early observations and these early researchers were talking about the heart like it had a mind of its own. Mm -hmm. We now know that the heart actually does have its own intrinsic, technically called intrinsic cardiac nervous system, but the brain and the heart. And yeah. that term was coined by the field of neural, it's called neural cardiology, people who study the, the neural structures in the heart. But the, and this may, what I'm about to say next may sound like some new finding, right? It's an exciting discovery, and that is that the heart literally sends far more information through the neural fibers, the neural systems, the autonomic system, to the brain, and the brain sends to the heart. Mm. That's actually been known since the late 1800s. It was just kind of forgotten and ignored, you know, until more recent years, the last 20 years or so. So um, that's one of the, I'm just giving you, I'm trying to keep this kind of simple so we don't get too, yeah. too sciencey and neurosciencey language here. So it's this activity, this neural communication between the heart and the brain that gives rise to what's called the heart rhythm. Now, technically, that's called heart rate variability, and which is very different than heart rate. So most people know what heart rate is, right? Just how many times did our heart beat in a minute? But in reality, Tom, in a healthy person, resilient person, our heart rate is changing with each and every heartbeat. So it's that beat to beat variability that is what's called heart rate variability. So it takes a lot more precision and measurement to, you know, rather than just counting how many times you get a, a beat in a minute, to actually measure the, these time changes between each heartbeat. And that's what gives rise to a heart rhythm. So if you think about it, if the time between each heartbeat was the same, right, it would be like a, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for? A metronome. A metronome, right? It's the same all the time. And there would be no heart rhythm. It would just be the steady heart rate. And in fact, we, it, it, this is also interesting, and not that many years ago, 20, 30 years ago, uh, physicians and doctors were taught that uh, a sign of good health was a steady heart rate. 
we a absolutely wrong. In fact, if, if we lose this natural variability, that is a strong predictor of future serious health problems, like dying. <laughs> you know, but in any, so it's also our best marker of aging. So we have more variability when we're, of this natural heart rate variability when we're young, and it decreases more, more or less linearly as we age, if we're on a normal, healthy aging trajectory. Uh, what's also very clear, we, we, we have lower variability than we should for our age. So I already mentioned that's a strong risk factor. Um, but the, one of the main reasons that people have lowered variability, I mean, it can be because of disease process, of course, like diabetes or cancer, these types of things. Uh, but the main cause is stress, long-term accumulated stress, just the extra wear and tear we're putting on our, our nervous system, basically brain and nervous system through accumulated stress. So uh, I'm kind of rambling a little bit here. I don't, hope I'm answering the question. Yeah, no, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so what I'm getting is that the, um, the more flexible, basically, our heart can be. It, it's not just the heart. See, it's an integrated system. It, yes, it's the heart and the intrinsic, actually the nervous system within the heart, mm. but it's all the neural fibers that are connecting the heart and the brain and the brain itself all have to be functioning properly to generate normal heart rate variability. So it's this wonderful measure, if we look at how much variability we have, of the complete integrated system and all the factors that affect the heart and brain. Mm. Now, that's kind of a basic, you know, so heart rate variability, I'll, I'll just make this one comment here, is something that's really simple. The beat to beat change in heart rate, you know, and you connect the dots of this and it gives you the heart rhythm, what we call pattern. Mm. Or you can spend an entire career trying to understand it because it reflects so many things about what's going on in the body because of uh, that basic uh, connections I just explained between the heart and brain and all the things that affect those, those organs and systems. So now coming back around to coherence, when, well, I'm gonna, let me give you one more piece of the puzzle that might help your listeners. Uh, so back in the early 90s, when we were really first starting our, our lab in, in, in the psychophysiology field, uh, we were, started out by looking at the physiological correlates. In other words, what can we measure in the body? You know, brain waves and heartbeats and skin conduct. That's all these typical measures that we started with to, to look at the, uh, how emotions affected physiology. Now, this is a time that there were maybe two or three papers published in the medical literature about positive emotions. Tons on, you know, anxiety, depression, stress, but very little. Nobody had really thought about looking at things like appreciation or compassion uh, or feelings of kindness. This just didn't exist. So this is many years before the positive psychology movement and all that, which came many, many years later. And what we, so we were the first, one of the first, not the necessarily the first, to really start looking at not just stressful emotions, you know, frustration, anxiety, anger, and anxiety, and so on, but also more heartfelt positive emotions, we call them. And what we found was that the heart, first of all, that the activity of the heart was by far the best indicator of a person's emotional state, much more so than EEGs and brain waves and things like that. And in particular, when people were really feeling good, you know, uh, and we focused a lot back then on appreciation because that's one of the easier emotions for people to self-generate and, and so on than love and compassion and things. That the activity of the heart shifted into a very different pattern that we ended up calling coherence. And I mean, I, there's many rabbit holes we could go down here, the, uh, the significance of this. But basically what it's coherent, we now know there's 400 independent studies later now, right? So we've got a lot more information under our belt and understanding that when we're feeling these heartfelt positive emotions, our, our, the activity in all of our body systems flip into this other optimal state that we now, that we call coherence. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these systems in the body, like some of the easy ones to measure are blood pressure rhythms, heart rhythms, breathing rhythms, uh, different rhythms within the intestinal system, the gut, all have to synchronize and become more ordered and coherent and work together for this coherent heart rhythm to emerge. Okay. And, and including what's going on in our brain. Yeah. Right? Uh, all those systems have to flip into this more optimal state, which some people would call our, 
from the cardiovascular perspective, our resonant frequency. Mm -hmm. And, and we, the, we the whole system is more frequency. efficient at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Right, exactly. So uh, when we teach people how to become more coherent, so that led to the development of a number of techniques that allow us to shift into coherence right, right in the middle of the day. Mm. So it's, this is very um, different than like meditating. And we also have a meditation technique. So don't get me wrong. I'm not down on meditation or other uh, kind of things like that. I was a meditator for many years myself. Uh, in fact, in, in my own life, I, you know, before I uh, got involved with HeartMath and actually helped found the organization, you know, I was a, a 15, you know, this many years ago now, uh, 30 some years ago was, you know, I'd been a 15 year meditator myself and, I owned and had started a, a fairly successful company and, you know, I could have my morning meditations and really be out there and whipping energy through the chakras and all that stuff that you do and, you yeah. know, doing my breathing and this and that. And before I got to work hitting the traffic jams, right, you know, there I was, I was frustrated and I was impatient. And mm. we now know that even those kinds of emotions, subtle emotions, even though they weren't so subtle always. Uh, set in motion 1400 biochemical changes. I was depleting my energy. I was, and, that, and when we're feeling those emotions, that creates incoherent rhythms, which inhibits brain function. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Before you even got to work, let alone stepping in the door and being hit with all the stuff of a you know, large you know, company. Yeah. Um, so I hope I'm kind of making sense. So, where, where do you want me to focus on in, in the heart math approach? Is sure we have meditation, heart focused meditations that allow us to sustain coherence and train our nervous system to a new, to a new normal. But it's really about in the moment when we're when we're meeting the traffic jams. I mean, literally, but also figuratively of life. You know, the staff meetings, the phone calls, the dealing with difficult people, um, all of those types of day to day challenges. That's when we really need to be able to shift into coherence, have brain facilitate brain function. We have a wider repertoire of choices be able to self-regulate, maintain our emotional composure. And that, that's why that list of benefits is so long. Yeah. Right. If you get my, so we, we've taught this now in all over the world and, you know, 8,000 trainers later. So uh, yeah. hopefully that gives you a little bit of a background. I, I yeah, know, totally. like yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, it's just to summarize, it's kind of your body has all these different rhythms going on. Your brain waves, your heart rhythm, your blood pressure has its own fluctuation, fluctuating rhythm. Um, your breathing, your gut, and those rhythms can come into synchrony like a like a musical chord where all the wavelengths are kind of hitting hitting the bar at the same time. And at that point, your heart rate variability will increase, and that's incredibly good for your longevity. It's that, and and it's linked to positive emotion because positive emotion can actually trigger this state of coherence. Is, yeah, that, yeah. is that a fair summary? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, but not just positive emotions, but when people, uh, but yes, basically when we're naturally, so some people uh, believe in, in my field, psychophysiology, that how we feel, right, whether we're feeling kind of off and, you know, um, edgy and those kinds of things, our inner feelings that the brain is basically labeling mm -hmm. is reflects the body's inner states. Yes. So when the body's happy and all the systems are working together in harmony, mm. that underlies us perceiving and labeling that as feeling good. Mm. You know, we might not be walking around going, oh, I'm joyful, you know, or gagged out with appreciation. But, uh, <laughs> but that is, but it is those, you know, we feel safe and good and all that. That is reflecting this harmony within our body. So it's very holistic in that sense. You're not... You're, it's difficult to pin down what's causing what because there's such a dense interplay. Is that yeah, it's a system, a complex system, right? Yeah. Uh, um, right, right. And so obviously, you know, I'm probably going to ask, well, what's the relationship to breathing with this? Sure. Well, breathing, of course, breathing is, uh, we, we include breathing, we call it heart-focused breathing, it is the first step in most of our techniques. And... Uh, this is going back a few years, but it was actually interesting to, to understand deeper the mechanisms of breathing, mm -hmm. of how, why they really work. I mean, breathing's taught in everything you can think of, from the military for being a better shooter, to in law enforcement, to scuba diving, to uh, meditation, you know, Lamaz. I mean, you know, it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason why is it works, right? And so breathing, the breath is something we have in terms of our autonomic functions, the things that we normally aren't thinking of or aware of, 
breath is the one thing we can consciously intervene with. Mm. I mean, I'm not saying anything new here. I mean, uh, I can choose to breathe slower, deeper, faster, you know, whatever I, I want to do there. So the mechanisms and the reason that we do, and uh, so understanding breathing, the mechanisms of it is a great way to help start the shift into coherence. But it's not just about breathing, right? If, if breathing techniques have been around for thousands of years, and if that was the solution, you know, we would, the world would not be in the state it's in right now, mm -hmm. just about breathing. But, uh, but no, it's important. But let me give you the mechanisms of how I perceive, and I think the science is very clear now on, on the mechanism, actually, of why breathing techniques work. And I actually call this grandma's wisdom. You know, if you think back, even my grandmother, when we were little kids, you know, you fall down, you scrape your knee or something, you know, and after you, they pick you up, make sure you're not got blood squirting out and stuff. But what's we use the first thing grandma says, right? Take a deep breath, honey, breathe. Mm. They just intuitively know that until we calm down, right, nothing's going to happen. We're not going to be able to hear anything or even talk about what's wrong and these kind of, anyway. I'm, so basically, here's the mechanism, Tom. There are neurons in the lungs that are uh, mechanosensitive neurons, are technically called, but they're sensitive to stretch. So when they get stretched, they increase their firing rate. They output more. So we breathe in these neurons in the lungs. So there are nerves through the vagal nerves that connect to the lungs that go up to the brain stem, to the, the medulla. And basically what they, when those neurons are firing more is they inhibit. So you can think of this like a little switch. You know, they kind of open the switch um, so that the, what's called parasympathetic or vagal activity flowing from the brainstem down to the heart is decreased. So parasympathetic, the vagus nerve is the main nerve of the parasympathetic nervous system. So parasympathetic activity slows heart rate. Mm. So when we inhibit the flow of parasympathetic to the heart, heart rate increases. Right? Okay. So you can see that when you breathe in, if you're watching on one of our devices or other heart rhythm monitors, that when you breathe in, your heart rate increases. Mm -hmm. And you breathe out, those the stretch is released. That flow of parasympathetic activity of the heart is back. So heart rate decreases. Uh -huh. So basically, whatever our breathing rhythm is modulates the heart rhythm with that frequency. And the deeper we breathe, the longer the breath, the more the modulation. Mm -hmm. So it, it, whenever you're breathing, whatever it is, whatever rhythm, however deep, it's modulating the heart rhythm. Mm -hmm. So we can tell exactly what somebody's depth of breath and frequency of breath is just by looking at the heart rhythm. Mm -hmm. It's one of, the, one of the many factors that affect the rhythm. Okay, so good so far, but so what at this point? That doesn't really do much. Here's where the, the story really gets interesting. As I mentioned earlier, Tom, the heart sends more information to the brain than the other way around. Mm. So those heart rhythms, that neuro information from the heart and cardiovascular system, a lot of information is going upstairs to the brain. And there are direct neural pathways from, it's called afferent, is the technical word in neurosciences, but that ascending neural information goes to all, directly to almost every major brain center. And there's a couple of, for this discussion, a couple that are especially important. One is this direct neural pathway goes to the, a part of the brain called the thalamus, very center, the very core of our brain. We only have one of these. It has many important functions. One of those is that it's what synchronizes the electrical activity of the entire brain. So if we, it's well known in neuroscience that the, the brain has to be able to synchronize its own electrical activity Mm. even be conscious, let alone perform well. Mm. And the degree of synchronization is actually one of the most important things. I mean, proper, appropriate synchronization now uh, of neural activity. Now, when I say synchronization, I don't mean everything's doing the same thing at the same time. Mm. Right? Mm. I mean that the neural electrical systems are synchronized. Um, so when we have incoherent rhythms, like naturally occur when we're frustrated or impatient, that is the rhythm that goes up to the thalamus. And, it, and this is actually the mechanism of the term I introduced earlier. It interferes with the thalamus's ability to synchronize global electrical activity. And that's why they use the term uh, cortical inhibition. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and so when we get angry at somebody or are anxious and we're in this incoherent state, we're desynchronizing neural function. So this is kind of the mechanisms of why, and not that this has ever happened to, any, to you or any of our listeners, that we get a little upset with somebody and we blurt out something that we later regret, 
right? Cortical inhibition. Okay. Um, now, uh, on the other hand, when we're coherent, that rhythm also goes up to the thalamus and, and enhances neural synchronization. So it, it, the brain's the big winner when the heart's coherent. Mm. Right, so reaction times are improved. The frontal cortex is enhanced. So our ability to self-regulate, understand how our behaviors and actions affect the future, all of that is enhanced. It yeah. depends to turn cortical facilitation. So, so I've been doing a bit of coherent breathing um, for the last few months. And I have to say, when I'm doing it, I, I have ideas. Like while I'm doing it, I have solutions to things that I've not even been aware were a problem just mm -hmm. popping into my head. So is that what's happening there? Is that because Yeah, of yeah absolutely. That's, that's a big part of it, yes. You're facilitating cortical function. But the heart's the, what's driving that, right? If you get my drift. Now, the other neural pathway, I mean, there's many, but that's relevant, I think, for your question, why breathing techniques work, right? Because you, you, you consciously breathe, you're changing the input from the heart to the brain, is to the amygdalas. And the amygdalas are basically structures involved very much in emotional experience. And what they do is they determine what, basically the function of the amygdala is to determine what is familiar and not familiar. Right? Yeah, okay, I've never heard it put like that, but yeah, okay. Yeah, that's, yeah, this is uh, the work of uh, one of my mentors. What I know about the brain, mostly I learned from, from the guy named Dr. Carl Cleveland, uh, who's now, who has now passed a few years ago, but is considered the father of modern cognitive neuroscience. Very famous guy. If you've ever heard of the holographic perception theory, potentially that was Dr. Prebrim. He's the guy, he was one of the first three neurosurgeons in the world, actually. Okay. And went into, it was head of neuroscience at Stanford for many years and, and so on. But um, what he actually proved is what the amygdala does is determine what's familiar or not familiar. And that does that from both the body's external sensory systems, what we see here, smell, right? But also interception, what's going on within our body. So to determine what's familiar or not familiar, it has to have a reference that it's comparing the now to, right? Now this actually ended up explaining, understanding this, why the heart reflects emotional states, the rhythm of the heart, because like frustration looks different than anxiety and so on and so on, very specific rhythms reflect our, our emotional states. So the, basically, um, I, I'm gonna get too sciencey here, I need to kind of back off a little bit, but basically, the inputs from the heart to the amygdala. In fact, these cells in the core nucleus of the amygdala are literally synchronized to the heartbeat. So whatever the heart rhythm is, that's exactly the same rhythmic pattern that the amygdala is firing and monitoring. Mm. You know, this is well, we know this. So it's monitoring the rhythm of the heart and basically determining based on the pattern of the heart rhythm, what the, the body, heart, especially the heart and body are feeling, right? and comparing that to laid down reference patterns. So this is the pattern we associate with frustration or anxiety or feeling good, right? These types of things. Then the, the cortical stuff is monitoring and labeling that. I feel good, I feel appreciation, I feel anxious, I feel stressed, mm -hmm. so on. So when we change the rhythm of the heart, that is going directly to the amygdala. It goes, oh, ha, huh, calm, safe, mm -hmm. body's feeling good. So we, it's a, so breathing is an indirect way of mod, of really modulating our emotional state, right? And synchronizing neural activity. So that's the next, some of the, hopefully that helps give a little understanding to the mechanisms. It's through, particularly through rhythmic breathing that we can do that. So that works. Well, well, yeah, exactly. But if, if, so, but here's the kicker. So for the ordinary world, people who aren't used to breathing practices. Yeah. Uh, doing breathing, especially if it's pace breathing, where we're having them follow a pacer, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. At a certain rhythm. Um, well, not, I shouldn't say especially. We'll feel about half the population we find that becomes uncomfortable after about a minute. They don't like it. It doesn't feel good. Now, what I was just explaining about what the amygdala does helps us understand that. So if uh, it's really a maladapted brain in a way, but being coherent, especially if, it's, if we're doing coherent rhythmic breathing, not, you know, like stop, hold your breath. So to re the uh, resonant frequency is a five seconds in, five seconds out breath. It's a, a 10 second rhythm. That is what our cardiovascular system naturally likes to, to, buy, to oscillate at when we're in this coherent or resonant state. But if the amygdala doesn't have a familiar reference to that particular pattern, because we've been in stress or 
just uh, it hasn't become familiar with that to have a familiar reference, there's a mismatch, and that equals uncomfortable, uh, uncomfort. Right, so it takes time to train that uh, that new baseline, as we call it, or familiarity. <clears throat> so that so breathing is step one, and absolutely breathing is a great technique. That's why we use it to take the. So let's say if, if it's in the context of an emotional reaction, somebody cut us off in traffic or said something in that meeting, we're reacting, right? We're, uh, breathing is there's that grandma's wisdom again will take the intensity out of the emotion. So it'll calm down, you know, the outflow in the nervous system. It's, you know, you know, increasing the heart rate and triggering the flows of adrenaline and all that. But that's, and that's great, right? But all we've, what we've really done is lowered the intensity. We're still feeling the anxiety, the frustration, the impatience. Mm. It's still creating the same hormonal releases and the same incoherences in the system, just at a lower amplitude. Okay. So breathing, that's why we use step one, calm the system down. So we can then choose to shift our emotional state into one that takes us into incoherence. Mm. And is that about attention training or is it about what you're paying attention to? Well, you have to be, first of all, paying attention to what we're feeling. Yeah, what's going on in our our, our body, nervous system, brain. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. So yes, it, you know, being self aware is step one, obviously. Uh, and there's a whole methodology we've developed for all these phases. But after you do the heart, we do say heart focused breathing, and heart focus is important, by the way, because where you focus attention in the body, we know you can cause specific changes. I mean, there's a whole industry founded on this concept. No, like more than a concept, this principle. You know, bio, the biofeedback bio industry. Um, so the focus of attention in the area of the heart, doing heart-focused breathing, we actually tell people, pretend you're breathing through the heart, or the center, not the physical heart, but the, the center of the chest area. Mm. So you have your attention there, and then breathing slower and deeper, usually five seconds in, five seconds out, or four, you know, four or five seconds in that range. Now we're breathing at the rhythm of our resonant frequency. So that starts the shift into coherence. Mm. Now, quit thinking about breathing once you get familiar with that rhythm. And we have a number of different techniques, but one, a popular one I, I like is called attitude breathing. So it might be that you're feeling impatience. You know, there you are in a traffic jam. Well, so getting frustrated is not going to make the traffic move any faster. All it does is create hormonal patterns and stuff that ages faster, right, and stress our system. Yeah. Well, this is where you choose. Oh, I will now breathe. I'm going to add to the breathing. I'm forgetting about the cognitive breathing, you know, getting your, let's get the rhythm familiar. So you start breathing in the feeling of patience, right? So that starts shifting the emotional system as well. So now you, you, you're doing a whole lot more than you in the, from a body perspective than you did by just breathing. Now you're starting to shift the frequency of the emotion, the quality of the emotion into one that's, that's depleting us and aging us to one end of that's renewing us. Mm. Right. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Fascinating stuff. Yeah. So we have many techniques and I mean, what more we more than we have to go into time to, you know, there's a lot more we could talk about here, but yeah. Cause I, I, the, the one thing that I did want to say about the emotion stuff, um, based on the, one of the, one of the things in one of your books was exactly what you said about how we all know stress is bad for us. We know that not just scientifically, but colloquially, it's common knowledge. And, and we don't really think about how feeling good is good for you. Um, but, and, and that immediately triggers like, a, oh, but there's a kind of guilt associated with doing things that make you feel good. But then the emotions that you specify as the healthiest for you to feel and that have the best kind of impact on your longevity are care and compassion and appreciation and kindness, uh, and, kindness and, and all these things that are the opposite of selfish and actually like ego depleters because they're all about ex expansion of your awareness yeah, to yeah. Other, other people yeah may, maybe a way of thinking of it because i i personally don't think of it that way but it, it's amazing how much energy people will put into their diet some people right they read the labels and you know on and on it goes right so we become more conscious of our diet so what I'm talking about really, Tom, is being more conscious and putting even a fraction of that kind of care into our emotional diet. Mm -hmm. 
because uh, we have much more power to choose our emotions and be in charge of them, if you will. Yeah. Uh, really nice. Most people understand or, or have any idea of uh, just because they haven't been taught how. Yeah. And that's really where I think HeartMath is made. Not, and not just HeartMath. There's lots of great programs out there. But, mm. uh, a significant contribution to the world is giving people simple step-by-step -step processes for being able to become more aware of and responsible for their emotional diet. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, I think it's really, really fascinating stuff because, and obviously I've um, learned a lot of Buddhist meditation techniques that focus on kindness. Sure, as sure. As loving, well, kindness, passion. Passion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But what's so interesting about your research and why, I'll put a, a link in the comments uh, below for people to go and have a look at the book that I'm talking about here so that it's not just completely alien, but um, where you talk about how different frequencies the heart has different frequencies for each different emotion to the point where you can look at a frequency, a, 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 you know, a pattern of heart variability and say, okay, well, this guy's feeling this emotion with this much intensity. Yeah. Um, and, and so it's that whole, you know, this ancient meditation techniques, but backed up so deeply with science now from, from your research. It's really right, interesting right. stuff. Um, but if we, if, cause we've gone quite deeply there into what's happening on a individual level from the heart, the breath, the brain and consciousness and, and emotion uh, in terms of coherence, could you talk a little bit about, um, why it's important on a, on a social level uh, and what can happen? Sure. Um, oh, there's so many ways we could do a whole hour just on that, but let me, uh, what I find that a lot of people find interesting, so let me just, so let me just go here on this is that. So we've been talking about neural synchrony and all that stuff. But, you know, when you go to the doctor's office, and they put electrodes across your chest to measure the electrocardiogram, the heartbeat. I mean, it's called the electrocardiogram because we're measuring electricity. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, literally. So you're measuring current flow. Uh, and the heart is the largest source of electrical energy, rhythmic electrical energy in the body. But whenever we have current flow, you also create a magnetic field. Right? So the electrodes don't measure the magnetic field, they measure the current flow. But you use a different instrument to measure the magnetic component, which is called a magnetometer. Now, one of the qualities of magnetic fields is they, they go right through things. And this is why, you know, I'm going to use a cell phone analogy here, because I think this really helps people understand this. Uh, we all, I can prove that, you can prove this to yourself. Get your cell phone out and make a call when you're inside of a building. Yeah, it, it goes through the walls. <laughs> it goes through the walls, right? And, and it's the magnetic field I'm talking about is exactly the same kind of magnetic field we use with our any kind of communications device to carry information. Mm. So we have, we create, it's called the carrier wave, you know, the magnetic, electromagnetic field, but the magnetic's the one that goes through the stuff. That's carrying the picture, the text message, your voice when you're making your cell phone call. So the magnetic field generated by the current flows of the heart radiate external to the body. And how do I know this? We can measure them. Right? Mm. So I'm not talking about necessarily an aura here. Mm. Uh, I'm not saying they're not real. Just can't yet really measure them here in my lab. I can measure magnetic fields. Yeah. So with the sensitivity of the, of the today's magnetometers, we can measure the cardiac field, the heartbeat, about uh, a meter, three foot away from the body. Doesn't mean it doesn't go farther. That's the sensitivity of the instruments, right? Okay. Now, when we measure those magnetic fields, and use what's called spectral analysis. And by the way, my previous life. Uh, was I was a communication engineer and just worked for Motorola. So I know a little bit about how to do some of this. Uh, using the same techniques we would use to uh, look at the information being carried by the, the magnetic, the electromagnetic field by a cell phone or two-way radio, whatever. We, we can apply those same techniques to the heart, the magnetic field of the heart. And lo and behold, this was actually amazingly easy to do. Just nobody ever thought of it before. We were, able, we were able to tell what a person's emotional state is by looking at the information patterns being carried by the magnetic field. Okay. So there's a, there's a pattern to the field, just well, like there's a being to the, by the, the, the field. Just like this, the, that's why the cell phone is such a good analogy. Mm. The, the magnetic field of the heart is the carrier, and it's being modulated and carrying, uh, for sure, emotional information, probably much, much more information is contained in that field. <coughs> Excuse me. So, and this is all published. If people are interested, they can go to a heartmath.org site, research library, and it's a whole section on, on this kind of stuff. 
then the next step was to ask, okay, we know we're radiating the magnetic field, our personal field environment, we call it, and that we can measurably see different information being carried by the field that relates back to emotional state and the heart rhythm as well. Okay, so what? Is that, is that having a measurable effect on others? Right, so yes, the answer is yes. So our nervous systems appear to be exquisitely tuned to these other biologically generated informational patterns and fields. So are we, so we can feel somebody else's field that their heart's generating? Yeah. And we can- Well, it's, it's really their whole system. It's their heart's generating the field, but it's being modulated by what the brain's doing. Yeah, okay, okay. So, so that, that. are we sensing that through our own field? Yeah, we're, we're sensing that through our nervous system's ability to detect these external fields, right? Okay. Uh, so, I mean, we, we have it in our language, right? God, the tension was so thick in that room, you could cut it with a knife. Yeah, well, I mean, because I was, I was reading this in your, in your work, and, and even the picture um, that you show of the kind of, uh, what's it called, the, the scientific word for a donut? Throttle. Uh, so, the, the, the Torus, the the yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, oh, so, yeah. yeah. Um, and there's a picture that you show of, of yeah. the field around somebody. Yeah, and that is the actual shape of the field, by the way. Yeah, it is a, a donut or toroidal shape. Yeah, and and it looked like to me, it reminded me of the um, I don't know if you know the artist Alex Gray, but he's like a visionary artist that paints mm. energy. I do know a little bit about that. Yeah, uh, and it, it, that's what it looked like to me, uh, and it made me think. You know, when you say this is intuitive, we we know intuitively all, all of these things that you're proving. Yeah. Um, it's almost like <laughs> it made me think like maybe that the people who believe in auras, who say that they can see auras, that they almost have like a synesthetic part to their brain that's capable of... Yeah. Now, again, I, I'm, I'm being very clear here. I'm, and I'm not saying we don't have an aura. I'm just saying the magnetic field is not the aura. Okay. I think that is really more photonic than this magnetic field I'm talking about, which we can very, very reliably measure the, the magnetic field. It's not like a hit and miss thing. I mean, mm -hmm. every time the heart beats, you generate a magnetic field, which can be measured. Um, yeah. So... To, just to take that story on, not only were we able to show uh, that our nervous systems detect the fields of others, but multiple studies now have shown that they have measurable effects. So when somebody's in a coherent state, we are radiating a more coherent informational pattern into the field. And that actually now we know has an uplifting effect on other people, even if they don't have a clue what you're doing. Mm. Right? And then that's also in our language. God, it just felt really good to be around so and so, right? So it, it, we really can uh, either drag people down or help uplift people, yeah, depending upon the quality of the information in our own personal field environment. And again, this is this is like hippie language would be raise the vibration, but actually yeah, yeah. that is what you're doing on a scientific. Well, well, I think the new age and you know, we can call it the hippies back in the '60s actually had it right all along. Right. Now we're able to scientifically show that, yes, we do have a vibration and a personal vibration. And that really, uh, I think, when we go into social, what this really starts becoming about, uh, I, mean, I mean, you know, Tom, it's obvious that we have effects on others through our body language and the tone of our voice and, and all this. I mean, there's lots of uh, information on that. But what I'm suggesting here is in addition to all that, and probably even more important, is the energetic communication that's actually going on between people and, and within groups. I'll give you an example. You've probably, almost everybody, well, maybe not everybody's paid attention to it, but, um, and this is one of the, the issues in communication within groups. You know, and it's many studies, you know, estimate that somewhere between 70, depending upon the study, to 80% of mistakes in business and healthcare but everywhere you look, trace back to a problem in, in communication, communication problems. And one of the, when we look under the hood of miscommunication, one of the big factors, um, I, I believe, is sourced from this energetic communication, right? And it's a mismatch that is really what's going on. And I've actually watched, you know, about every week you can see this go on if you, if you pay attention, where if you're really, uh, you know, in a com kind of observing two people talking sometimes, and especially if there's a little emotional, you know, heat going on, so to speak. 
where you actually listen to the words of what somebody says. And I've watched this happen. They, they said something very clear, but they might have been feeling frustrated or, you know, something else underneath it, mm-hmm. even that had nothing to do with what they were saying. You know, they could have been that they're feeling overwhelmed, anxious, you know, upset about something else. Well, that's what their field is communicating. And I've actually watched people when they feed back what the person said, actually say what their emotional state was being communicated through the field, mm-hmm. you know, and swear, but that's what they said. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it had nothing to do with what they said. So it's more powerful than the words we're hearing. Exactly. In the, than the words. The vibration. Vibration. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. So you see, get my drift, right? So, so much of the problem in communication is the mismatch between the information we're radiating in our field mm. and what we're saying, actually saying. Mm. You know, we, we can be emotionally upset, in other words, and put on the plastic smile and be you know, communicating something. But what are people walking away with? They were angry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The information in the field environment. Yeah. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So, and, and so, if we can become coherent in our own bodies using the techniques of breathing, techniques of emotional awareness and, and right. shifting our attention, um, we can become more, more coherent ourselves, but also then that's having a positive impact on the people around us because we're going to make them more coherent if we're exactly. projecting that. Yeah. Uh, and then that leads to, I'm guessing, well, uh, all this better. Yeah, we don't necessarily make them more coherent. People have a choice. Okay. But if our field environment is coherent, it gives them a chance. It's a, it's a frequency that, can, that you can help lift. They'll help lift others. Okay. You know, but if I, if I want to stay angry, I'll stay angry. But a little harder, you know, if you're in a coherent field environment. And so what would happen if uh, everyone in the world became coherent? <laughs> but now we move to global coherence. Yeah. Uh, and I know we only have a, a few minutes left here. So yeah, I'll try because uh, th- this again is a whole interview or, or talk to, to get into this, but yeah. um, what we're proposing here and more and more of the, the studies, again, we've published quite a few studies in the last couple of years on this. Uh, it's called the Global Coherence Initiative or GCI, but we've basically been putting, uh, installing magnet, mag- magnetic monitoring stations around the earth uh, that are designed to measure the magnetic rhythms and frequencies of, of the earth's magnetic fields. And as it turns out, this has just totally amazed me that uh, if we look at the Earth's magnetic, geomagnetic field, you know, the thing our compass is tuned into, which by the way is the same shape of the Hartz field, right? That donut or toroidal shape, you know, the North and South Pole. Mm. Well, one of the, if you uh, rec- uh, kind of time travel back to science class when we were, you know, back in school, and most people got to dump iron filings on a glass plate, right? And you put the magnet under it. And they all magically kind of dance around and show you the shape of whatever the magnet is. But if you recall, those iron filings line up in very specific lines. Mm. It's not a homogeneous black, you know, blob yeah. showing you the field. Those, and those are called flux lines or field magnetic field lines. They're real things. Same thing at Earth's magnetic field. Now, what's really wild, and this is literal, those magnetic fields, you can pluck them and they vibrate just like guitar strings. With, so pluck them with other magnetic energy. Well, in this case, what I'm talking about Earth, it's actually the solar wind okay. yeah. that's rushing by. You know, and Earth is turning in that, and your solar wind's coming by on a quiet day at a million miles per hour. You know, and the solar wind pressure is enough that it pushes in the field on the daytime side of the Earth mm. and stretches it out on the nighttime side. You know, this is basic you know, stuff I forgot, we learned in school, forgot. Right, but the point here is that as the Earth is turning in the solar wind, it's vibrating the strings. And they're really long, so they have a low frequency. One of the standard resonant frequencies of mag- Earth, the Earth magnetic field lines is 0.1 hertz. The same frequency as the coherent human heart rhythm. Mm. That's far out. Isn't it? And then we also <laughs> have, have it's, it's really crazy. It's, it's, it's more than far out. And we have another set of magnetic waves around the Earth with completely different mechanisms. I don't have time because we only have a couple of minutes here, but yeah, that are called Schumann resonances. And everybody makes a big deal about Schumann. Well, not everybody, a lot of people, because there's they, they only think there's one. There's actually eight, right? The first one's seven point eight three hertz, but they all overlap human brain waves. They're just at a much lower 
magnitude than the field line resonances that are and it's really I, whether this means anything uh, i don't have a clue but earth <laughs> and humans have a, a similar ratio remember mm -hmm. i men, men, mentioned that you can measure the heart's magnetic field three feet about it from the body you can measure a brain wave about an inch away okay yeah so energetically the heart's the big player here well, as it turns out, it's the same way with Earth. The field line resonances are the big, big rhythms that are the same as the heart. And the human resonances are tiny compared to the field line resonances. Similar ratio to the heart and brain in humans in terms of the magnetic field strength. Mm. But Earth is also wide rhythm and the same frequency as our brain rate and our heart rhythm. So, are there any other animals that it does that for? Or is it just humans? Just do we know? Like, so I sorry, sorry, do, is there any other animals that, that have that? Oh, yeah. Most animals actually also have the same cardiovascular rhythms we do ah. and brain waves to a certain degree. <clears throat> uh, okay. Well, I don't want to go on too long because I know we've gone over a little bit, but I do have one more question, which I ask to everyone that I interview, um, which is if, if people watching this can do one thing today that will improve their well being tomorrow, um, what would you have them do? Yeah, I, I would say not only improve their well-being today and, on, and ongoing, but also improve the planet at the same time. So I'm gonna I'm gonna finish where I was just going. Okay. Okay. Cool. So basically, through resonance principles, what we're suggesting in global coherence is that not only is our personal field environment affecting those around us, but it's also coupled to the Earth's field through resonance. So what I to answer your question, I would encourage people to maybe pause throughout the day and just do an inner kind of check inner check on what am i feeding the field just ask yourself what am i feeding the field both my personal field and also if i'm right the big global field because we're always feeding the field all the time and start taking more self-responsibility for that am i feeding the field kindness compassion appreciation you know uh, or am i feeding the field frustration, irritation, impatience, anxiety, because I didn't get my to-do list done fast enough. Because mm. I'm saying it matters. Yeah. And as more of us learn to create a more coherent field environment, and breathing being the first step, but then actually choosing to, to put more love, compassion, kindness, gratitude, appreciation into our own system and our field environment, but that's really the, the secret that's hidden in the open. To, to our own health and longevity and healthy aging, but also to helping shift planetary consciousness. Awesome. Roland, thanks so much for uh, coming on the channel. My, my pleasure. Uh, I hope it's been uh, interesting and useful for your listeners. Thanks for watching. I hope you found that uh, as interesting as I did. Some totally far out ideas, but really nice to think about. Um, I will leave links in the description below to the books that we're talking about uh, and also to heartmath.org where you can go and uh, read some of their research and look at what they're doing. Um, there's loads more videos, of course, of, of Roland on YouTube if you have a look uh, um, where he's presenting some of his ideas um, at events and things like that. Uh, I think I'll also leave a link to this really cool project that they did at Burning Man um, with an artist called Pablo Gonzalez Vargas. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, and the artist built this installation that kind of looks like a kind of a tree or like a world naval archetype. Um, and then everyone sort of around it is connected to heart rate variability monitors that are kind of monitoring how coherent they are, but also how coherent they are in relation to the group around them. And as they become more coherent as they all synchronize in their biorhythms, uh, then the actual installation starts lighting up. Uh, and it's really beautifully executed, perfect piece of interactive art. Um, so I'll leave a link to that as well. Definitely go and check it out. Thank you for watching uh, and I'll see you again soon. Thank you.